teaching at Sassy. I used to teach at Sassy, and I don't anymore. Um, but maybe I'll be able to come back at some point. So my name is Dr. Becca Chunkanelli. I'm a chemistry instructor, but I've moved over to the Center for Teaching and Learning to be the inclusive pedagogy lead. Um, I taught at SASI for about 16 years, and the reason that I changed jobs, I'm hoping to still teach for SASI. I actually negotiated that as part of my new job to be able to come back, and I may even teach an organic chemistry co-seminar next semester if any of you are taking organic chemistry. Um, I wanted to talk to faculty. I just was hearing so many stories from students about how people were teaching, and I wanted to have a bigger impact. So I thought if I can start doing workshops with faculty, um, maybe I can start impacting how they treat students, how they assign classes, or how assign material and exams. So I, I do workshops, and I see probably 100 people a week, whether it's graduate students or faculty. So I hope that I'm starting to have an impact. We'll see. So the first thing I want you to do is rename yourself. So if you go to the participant button and you hover over your own name, you should get a more. And I want you to rename yourself. And this is how I want you to do it. I want you to put your first name. Now, if your first name, if people mispronounce your first name, write it the way you say it. So I'm going to actually write my name. Sorry, people are coming into the waiting room. Um, I'm going to write my name like I say it, and so you can see how I do that. You can write a pronoun if you'd like. And the class that you're taking that has like the hardest exams right now, so the one that you really want to be thinking about today, write that class into the, your name. I'm just going to write CTL because I'm not taking any classes right now. But see how I wrote my name Becca like that? So you, I, it shows you how to say my name. So everybody go ahead and rename yourselves and tell me your first name, if you want to put a pronoun, you can, you don't have to. And then the class in which you're taking these exams. I just want to get a sense of what classes these are. So you have to hover over, you just have to click on the participants button, hover over your own name, and there's a more button with an arrow down that you click and it should give you an option. Are people not, don't have an option to rename? Because I'm not seeing anybody doing it. I only have an option to, uh add a profile picture but not oh, rename myself okay so we didn't get that set up that's my fault Laura Lee, do you know how to set that up quickly or no it's fine if you don't let me give me like two seconds there you go everybody should be able to do it now sorry everyone it has to it's in your settings so sometimes we don't have it set up right are you seeing it now when you click by your name yes thank you awesome Thanks for letting us know. So you're for just your first name and then let me know what class this is. You can put a pronoun if you like. What's the class that you have exams in that you're focusing on today? I'm seeing most people put their first name, but just put a comma after your name. And then what's the class that you're in that you want to think about today that you're having some struggles in? I see some people putting answers as great chem, America at the movies, probability, math, psych, econometrics, statics, microeconomics, chem, critical thinking, astronomy, e-bio, gotcha, pre-calc, bio, poli sci, a talk, Spanish. Is the Spanish class multiple choice? Well, actually, I'm going to ask that question in a minute. Hang on, hang on. You don't have to answer that. Architecture. Okay, awesome. So let's, um, I'm going to ask you some questions and I'm going to ask you to use the reactions button. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. And this is what I want to know. I want to know if that class you're talking about were the exams 100% multiple choice? Just give me a thumbs up if you are dealing with exams that are 100% multiple choice. Okay. A few of you are dealing with a lot of multiple choice exams. Okay. So what if it's partly multiple choice? How many people have some multiple choice, some short answer? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of that. Gotcha. Okay. All right, here's the next question. Um, 
Are you having to deal with Proctorio? How many people thumbs up if you are having to use Proctorio for your exams? Okay. I'm so sorry. I'll just say that right now. Okay, awesome. Thanks for the feedback. This is great. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides again. Um, all right, so we're gonna ask you a poll. Are you ready, Laura Lee? We're gonna ask you another poll. So here's the question I wanna ask you. For which, to which task would you work harder? And this is sort of asking, what's the difference between studying and learning? To make an A on the test or to teach the material to the class? Which task would you work harder right now? And you have to really pretend that your professor is gonna ask you to get up to the board or get up on Zoom in front of everybody and teach the topic. Which one would you work harder for? It'd be like, I'm gonna say to you right now, you gotta show me how to convert miles per hour to kilometers per second. And I'm gonna highlight and, and I'm gonna pin your screen. I'm gonna have you tell all of your friends how to do that. Versus I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question on how to do that and I'm gonna make you answer a poll. Which one would you work harder for? All right, I'm seeing some mixed results. I think a lot of this has to do with the stress about exams right now. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of people say, if I had to teach the material to the class, that would be harder. So I, I agree. I think if you had to teach the material to the class, that, that's a whole nother level of learning, right? If I have to teach somebody how to do something, that's a little different than somebody's just gonna give me a question and answer, ask me to answer it. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is talk a little bit about something I call metacognition. So I want you to walk out of here today a little bit more aware of how you think, how you solve problems, and what you're doing when you're in lecture, because that is really gonna feed into how well that you are doing on the exam. So that's a term called metacognition that you might hear me talk about. All right, remove Proctorio, I hear you. And the last one is, um, do you really get your level of learning? So that's gonna be our first activity today is we're gonna start talking about really judging your level of learning. And you're really gonna to have to think about getting outside your own head and looking at how you study. And this is gonna be a much more productive hour for you if you're really honest. If you're really honest about how you're studying and you really wanna take responsibility for your grades getting better because it's gonna be really easy and I got it. I wanna blame Proctorio, I wanna blame the pandemic, I wanna blame that we have to learn online, I wanna blame that it sucks to be at home, I wanna blame that I'm with other people and it's not quiet. All of that is real, it's real. But what I wanna do today is help you get outside of that and say, is there a way for you to be more efficient and productive, okay? So one of the things is really tr translating to what the difference is between high school and college. Now, I think that there aren't a lot of freshmen here. I don't know how many freshmen are here. Give me a thumbs up if you, this is your first year at CU. I saw a lot of names of people that I recognize. Thumbs up if you're first year. Okay. Yeah. So one of the biggest transitions from going from high school to college is really dealing with the level at which they're asking you questions on exams. And the better that you get at really sitting in an exam and figuring out the level of the question, the better you're going to be at managing your anxiety during exams. So what we're used to in high school is exams that are down at the bottom here. This is typically what they're asking you to do in high school is remember, understand, and perhaps asking you to apply. College professors are rarely gonna ask you questions that are just about, do you remember what I said in class? Or even, do you understand what I said in class? They are gonna take what you learned in class and ask you to apply it, to analyze it, and to evaluate it. Probably not gonna ask you to create during an exam. That's a little high for an exam. They might do that on a project. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna play around with this little pyramid here and think about how can I use this concept of this pyramid when I'm taking an exam? Okay, so I'm gonna actually put you into some breakout rooms. And in these breakout rooms, you're gonna have one person who's gonna share their screen. And I've decided that is gonna be the person who got the most sleep tonight, last night. So the first thing you have to do when you get your breakout room is introduce yourself and then figure out how much sleep you got last night, like in hours, hopefully not minutes, hopefully in hours. And we are going to organize some words, okay? So I'm gonna give you some links 
in the chat window to use for this. All right, it's just gonna take me a minute. So Laura Lee, are we ready to set up breakout rooms? Yes, just let me know when you want. Yeah, to don't go yet. Okay, so everybody's gonna open up this link that I'm putting and then only the person that got the most sleep last night is gonna open the second link. So here's the first link. So everybody can open up this first link and make sure that you're opening up and you see that same pyramid that I just showed you. And that's the basis for this exercise, okay? And then the second link is just for the person who's gonna be sharing their screen and typing and answering the question. So that is not everybody. And here's the reason I'm saying that. If you all get on that document, it's gonna start getting really edgy, right? Google Docs don't like having more than 40 people on there. So we only open that second link if you're the person that got the most sleep last night, share your window and there's gonna be instructions for each breakout room. So you're gonna go find your breakout room and try to answer the question, all right? Are there any questions before we head out in breakout rooms? All right, we can open those breakout rooms then. All right, I think we're close, yeah? We're 38. All right, there it is, okay. All right, so thanks for playing that game. Um, I, I, you, and you might wonder why we did that. So th this is, these are my answers. So remembering is recognizing, recalling, understanding is when I have to generalize or restate something. Applying is when I'm asked, starting to be asked to compare things. When I have to analyze is where I I'm, I'm, might be given some data, like a graph or a chart or a picture, and I have to interpret that picture. That's actually pretty challenging. Um, evaluating is when I have to maybe rank things. So I remember when I wrote chemistry tests, there might be times where I'd say, here are four um, acids, rank them in terms of strength. That's challenging. That's probably asking you to utilize several different things that I taught you. Invent and design, again, probably not an exam. But here's the thing I want you to use this for, is that when you are taking tests, so many people read a question and panic because they can't figure out if it's a really, it seems easy, but maybe I'm being tricked or um, wow, this seems really hard, so you're overthinking it. Or sometimes people just take tests from top to bottom, which actually is not a really great strategy for taking tests. It's really a better strategy to build your confidence and start with the easier questions first. So if you can start finding these words inside the question, you can start locating for yourself how, what level this question is at. And so I did this once this um, in front of a big chemistry lecture. I showed them this question, which you might not do chemistry so you don't know the answer to this question. I already gave it to you, it's B. But a lot of people see this question, they see a simple set of pictures and they think it's a low level question. So a lot of people answered this wrong. This is actually a level four question where I'm asking you to compare um, and interpret different pictures. So whenever I have a picture or a graph, it's typically a higher level question. So you want to make sure that that's not the first question you tackle, unless, unless you have figured out that that's your favorite part of this class and you got that, right? Whatever it takes to build your confidence as you're taking an exam is what you wanna to try to do. So just here's some good tips, okay, to taking exams, but then I also wanna address what's happening in the online world, okay? So first of all, just general exam taking tips. See if you can identify the level of the question. Feel, you should feel fine skipping a question, coming back to it later. You shouldn't let that make you feel bad. That is actually a really smart strategy when you're taking a test. So try to do the lower level questions first. That also will help you budget your time. I had so many students tell me that they got stuck on a question, gave it way too much time and energy and ran out of time for questions that they actually could have gotten right and just didn't have time to give to. So make sure that that helps you budget your time if you're going through there and doing the lower level questions questions first. Then when you're doing a higher level question, see if you can break it down. Some people just go through it and jump to conclusions. If you can take a minute without even looking at the answers and start to break apart the question, that's what I saw a lot of advanced students doing, is they would start breaking apart the question and asking themselves different parts of the question, like really analyzing it before they start looking at the answers. It's really tempting to go look at the answers if it's multiple choice and start figuring out, how, trying to get your brain to pick an answer. That's another really, really good strategy for a test is to cover up the answers. So try this on a practice exam. Cover up the answers, read the question, see if you know what the answer is. Don't let your brain work on it for a minute instead of jumping right into answers. 
And then always work backwards to make sure your answer makes sense. So if you're doing some sort of calculation problem, make sure you're coming back and sticking it back in and saying, wait a minute. So does that answer make sense or does it seem really big or really small? And sometimes I coach people on short answer exams that if you think your answer doesn't sound right, write that on your exam, write down, I'm sure this is too big. I must have made a calculation error because I know my answer should be somewhere in this range and it's not. The professor will actually notice that. A lot of them will, not all of them. And then if you're taking a multiple choice test, make sure that you take the time to rule out the other answers that will also build your confidence. All right, so we're actually gonna do something that you may not want to do. So I, my job though, I told you this today, my job was to make you a little uncomfortable, to make you be really responsible for your learning. So writing about how you learn is a really powerful skill. So I want you to take out a piece of paper or maybe do this on your computer. We're just gonna take about three minutes. I want you to list two reasons. If you just took an exam or some exam this semester, why the exam was successful or not successful for you. So two reasons, right? What are you going to do differently while you're taking the exam next time? And what are you going to do differently to prepare for or study for the exam? So we're just going to take about three minutes, three minutes to do this. So really, I can't emphasize enough to actually write down your answers. It, 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 it locates a different part of your brain than looking at your screen. So you could even just like look away from your computer and write for a couple minutes about these questions, it'll be really valuable for you. So I'm just gonna stop talking and we're gonna take about two minutes, two to three minutes to do this. Now I'm going to ask for some brave people that are willing to share their answers in the chat. So if you're willing to share one of your reasons why the first test was successful or unsuccessful for you, type it in the chat. Let's hear some answers. Be brave. Share your wisdom with us. It's really, it's really wisdom to determine what you didn't do right, that you want to change. That's called productive failure, right? Productive failure means I'm making mistakes and I'm learning from my mistakes. Yeah, so learning study skills. So it's, yeah, we put it off because we're, we don't really know what to do. Yeah, and that's really common. A lot of people are telling me that. They're focusing on other classes. It's really hard to divide up your time evenly to get ready for them. Yeah, procrastination cramming really common too. Yeah, exam problems, sometimes they're harder than what they're doing in class. I hear that a lot. I don't know if you've got any practice exams to try. Yeah, reading the question properly, feeling rushed. 
Oh, right. So online, sometimes you can't really see, right? You can't see the next answer and you can't go backwards. God, that causes stress. I totally get it. Yeah. And it's really typical that the homework is different than the exam. So um, in terms of advocating for yourself, you can always, always ask your professor for practice exams or sample questions. Try to get them to give you more information about what the exam is going to look like. That is, it's totally okay to ask your professors for that. Um, if you do get a practice exam, though, make sure you take it like a real exam. Make sure you're looking at the questions without your notes, without looking, without working with a friend. Make sure you are, you can study with friends until you get close to the exam, but once you get close to the exam, you have to know how you're doing, okay? Let's see, what are you going to do differently during the next exam? Anybody willing to share that in the chat? What do you plan to do differently? Are there, did anybody have good strategies for these online tests? Like, what, what could you do differently? to get ready for online exams. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard that's hard, right? You got you, then once you pay attention more attention to that class, you might pay less attention to others. So, I've heard a lot of people tell me that they're they're bringing themselves to a pretty rigid schedule, like more than they ever had to before to really set up schedules and say, this is when I work on each class as much as I can. And man, it's so hard to create study groups in this world. You have to be really proactive to find study groups. Um, yeah, break up your studying. We're going to talk a little bit about procrastination before we leave today. Um, it's when you start cramming it in, you're putting it into your short term memory. So it really is a disservice, right? Because then you'll just forget. Yeah, I like sort of giving yourself time for each question. Um, again, that's hard online if you can't go forward or backward. And honestly, you can give your professors that feedback. You can tell them that when you can't go back to redo a question that's really hard for you and see if you can convince them. I know it's because of cheating concerns, but see if you can convince them it's really helpful for you to be able to move around on the exam. Um, study more effectively. Yeah, so we're going to talk more about studying effectively. This is great. Thank you so much for, for putting answers in the chat. Um, I know that that's, it's hard to talk about what you're not doing well. Okay, so sometimes there's this element of like, we, we know we need to not procrastinate or cram. We know we need to study more efficiently. And I think, I just want to show you a little video because I think it's going to lighten up this topic a little bit. So I'm going to show you a little video. Some of you who have been in my class have probably seen this video before. Don't just tune out because you've seen it before. Maybe you'll learn something new today from this video. Okay, but this is going to share some, this is going to talk about something that we all have in common. So it might just be, if nothing else, you walk away from here today feeling like somebody heard me, somebody got me. That's what I hope. Oh, you know what? I didn't share it with sound. Hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, get on. Okay. No, no, it was very, very. Anyway, today I'm a writer, blogger, guy. I write the blog, wait, but why? And a couple of years ago, I decided to... Uh, me. I think and I, I wanted messed to explain it up. To the... My bad. That the, the brains of procrastinators Can were actually different screen? than the Where brains of other people. Um, and to test yes, this, I found an MRI lab that actually yeah. let me scan both my brain there. Now can you and see the brain it? of a proven yeah. non-procrastinator, and I write about procrastination. My behavior is always per All right, sorry. Can you see my screen and you can hear it too? Correct. I was trying to turn on captions and it just <laughs> messed everything up. Okay, here we go. Plexed the non-procrastinators around me, and I wanted to explain to the non-procrastinators of the world what goes on in the heads of procrastinators and why we are the way we are. Now, I had a hypothesis that the, the brains of procrastinators were actually different than the brains of other people. And to test this, I found an MRI lab that actually let me scan both my brain and the brain of a proven non-procrastinator, and, and so I could compare them, and I actually brought them here to show you today, and I want you to take a look carefully to see if you can notice a difference. And I know that if you're not a trained brain expert, it's not that obvious, but just take a look, okay? So here's the brain of a non-procrastinator. Now, here's my brain. <laughs> there is a difference. 
both brains have a rational decision maker in them, but the procrastinator's brain also has an instant gratification monkey. Now, what does this mean for the procrastinator? Well, it means everything's fine until this happens. <laughs> so the rational decision maker will make the rational decision to do something productive, but the monkey doesn't like that plan. So he actually takes the wheel and he says, Actually, let's read the entire Wikipedia page of the Nancy Kerrigan Tanya Harding scandal because I just remember that that happened. <laughs> then, then we're going to go over to the fridge. We're going to see if there's anything new in there since 10 minutes ago. <laughs> After that, we're going to go on a YouTube spiral that starts with videos of Richard Feynman talking about magnets and ends much, much later with us watching interviews with Justin Bieber's mom. All of that's going to take a while, so we're not going to really have room on the schedule for any work today. Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> Now, what is going on here? The instant gratification monkey does not seem like a guy you want behind the wheel. He lives entirely in the present moment. He has no memory of the past, no knowledge of the future, and he only cares about two things, easy and fun. Now, in the animal world, that works fine. If you're a dog and you spend your whole life doing nothing other than easy and fun things, you're a huge success. <laughs> and to the monkey, humans are just another animal species. He has to keep well slept, well fed, and propagating into the next generation, which in tribal times might have worked okay. But if you haven't noticed, now we're not in tribal times. We're in an advanced civilization, and the monkey does not know what that is, which is why we have another guy in our brain. The rational decision maker who gives us the ability to do things no other animal can do. We can visualize the future, we can see the big picture, we can make long term plans. And he wants to take all of that into account, and he wants to just have us do whatever makes sense to be doing right now. Now, sometimes it makes sense to be doing things that are easy and fun, like when you're having dinner or going to bed or enjoying well earned leisure time. That's why there's an overlap. Sometimes they agree. But other times, it makes much more sense to be doing things that are harder and less pleasant for the sake of the big picture, and that's when we have a conflict. And for the procrastinator, that conflict tends to end a certain way every time, leaving him spending a lot of time in this orange zone, an easy and fun place that's entirely out of the make sense circle. I call it the dark playground. <laughs> Now, The dark playground is a place that all of you procrastinators out there know very well. It's where leisure activities happen at times when leisure activities are not supposed to be happening. The fun you have in the dark playground isn't actually fun because it's completely unearned and the air is filled with guilt, dread, anxiety, self hatred, all those good procrastinator feelings. And the question is in this situation, with the monkey behind the wheel, how does the procrastinator ever get himself over here to this blue zone? A less pleasant place, but where really important things happen. Well, it turns out that the procrastinator has a guardian angel, someone who's always looking down on him and watching over him in his darkest moments, someone called the panic monster. <laughs> Now, the panic monster is dormant most of the time, but he suddenly wakes up. Anytime a deadline gets too close or there's danger of public embarrassment, a career disaster, or some other scary consequence. And importantly, he's the only thing that the monkey is terrified of. Now, he became very relevant in my life pretty recently because the people of TED reached out to me about six months ago and invited me to do a TED talk. <laughs> Now, of course, I said, yes, it's always been a dream of mine to have done a TED talk in the past. <laughs> All right. So uh, I showed you that video because I want you to know that that's really, really common. And I also want you to make sure to know that I'm not invalidating the fact that、um, it's actually not easy to get stuff done right now, right? That hard, that hard space, that blue space he's talking about, it's not easy when your professor gives you a like 
hour and 15 minute lecture that you're supposed to watch nonstop that has no breaks for understanding, no breaks for questions. Like the way you're learning is so much harder than um, it should be. So I don't want you to think I'm invalidating that like, oh, you're all just being lazy and doing the easy stuff. What I want you to acknowledge is that it's hard to motivate yourself to sit and work when you have nobody to work with or when you feel lost or when you feel like the professor's not stopping to check and see if you get it. And that's just the reality we're living in right now. So I think, again, what I'm hoping that you might get out of being here today is to really just think about how can you feel more empowered in this moment? How can you feel more connected to what's important to you and that you can do what you need to do and get motivated because it's just not gonna get easier for a while. If you think there's an easy time coming up ahead, I have to promise you they're already starting to talk about fall 2021 having remote elements to it. So we all have to figure out how to be in this world, right? How to be successful in this world. So. I just want to talk to you a little bit about motivation because the motivation to study in the way that you know you need to is what's lacking, right? A lot of you really know ways to be efficient with your studying. If you don't, please set up an appointment and I will talk with you about how you study. But a lot of people have good strategies. It's just hard to motivate to do them. I just want to get up and check the refrigerator too. I'm doing that all day long working at home. And I'm, it's really easy for me to walk away from my screen because I'm so tired of my screen right now. So how do I get motivated, right? Because motivation is based on how I feel. And one of the things I really have to count on is willpower. That's the control exerted to do something. It's reliable. It's consistent. I can strengthen it. And it's not tied to how I feel, right? So if I say to myself, I have to do push-ups every day because that is what I know is good for my body and I know it's going to help me sit up in my chair straight when I'm sitting at my screen all day, I have to make myself do that. So you may have to use some willpower to get yourself into some new habits because the motivation is low right now. Mindset is also really important. It's really important that you're not in this fixed mindset where you think, I'm just not good at this. I'm not good at this class. I'm not good. So you have to watch those thoughts. They're in the background. When you're struggling with how you study in a course, you're struggling with exams, make sure you notice if you're having thoughts like that so you can move them to this growth mindset where you believe that you can get better at anything with some hard work, right? If, and, and I'll have to ask questions and I'm gonna to have to fail and fall down and ask for help, right? So this is one way to think about it, is if I meet a challenge, do I meet it head on and embrace it or do I avoid it, right? If I'm finding I don't know how to study for that test, am I pushing through that or I'm just giving up, I hate that test, I'm gonna forget about it, right? So what starting to notice those thoughts will help your motivation. If you notice that thought, just get it out of your head somehow and say, I know that I can get better at this. and I'm gonna push on, yeah? So we're probably not gonna have time for this because I wanna make sure that we get out of here on time today. But think about this. What are your strategies to stay motivated learning remotely? And if you wanna throw something in the chat right now, we can all learn from you. Has somebody come up with an idea of how to stay motivated when you're learning remotely? Has anybody figured out how to work on their mindset or be aware of procrastination? So throw it in the chat. Be really helpful for all of us. If you've got something that's working right now, let us know. If not, make it up. Like make up something new right now. What's some way that you can stay motivated when you're remote? Setting weekly goals, totally. And then is there some reward for that goal or do you have an accountability partner you can talk to who's like, hey, did you do that? Like having somebody check in with you is really helpful. I totally agree. Exercise is my go-to when I'm really feeling low. Just getting up, going for a walk, even just getting over there and doing some push-ups really helps me. Uh, Christina, are you willing to tell me what that means? Hook my future self up. What does that mean? You don't have to if you don't want to, but I'm curious what that means. All right, that's cool. You don't have to, you don't have to share. I assume what you mean is to be really connected to why you're doing things, right? So you are thinking about your future self and what you want to get out of being in college. So if you keep that, you might even want to make a sign for your wall or something that you can put up so that you can say to yourself, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm pushing through this time and why I'm paying for all this college, even though I'm not getting to be there very much of the time. 
Um, yeah, you know, changing your location. I was going to say that today. I think it's really interesting that sometimes when I'm not having a great day, I just move to a different spot in my house. Like there have been days I sit on my bathroom floor to work because it's just a new place. It has a new kind of light to it and it just feels different because I'm getting so tired of my office. So maybe that will help some of you. I have heard that a set schedule really helps, even if you don't have a class that day, to still think of it as a work day. So thinking of each day as if I could put in six to eight hours each day and break it up. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit before we go about how to break up that time too. Thank you for sharing these ideas in the chat. I really appreciate it. All right, so I want to share with you some sassy student study strategies. So I did a study, a, a research study with a bunch of sassy students, and they kept voting on what things were working for them. So I want to make sure you knew them because part of doing well on exams is being prepared. Part of not having anxiety when you're starting an exam is being prepared. So, and especially when it's online and you think, oh, I can always look things up, please don't do that. Pretend like you can't look at your notes and you'll be so much more prepared. So the first thing is to study in short bursts. So put your phone away. You can even tell people in your life, I'm gonna go study now so I'm not gonna be available for the next 45 minutes. And then really just focus for 45 minutes and then let yourself get up. So that's called, a, your coordinator might've called it a study cycle. It's been shown by psychology research that that will put the information in your long-term memory instead of your short-term memory. If you can really just give it 45 minutes of focus without interruption, that, that those interruptions are really not good for your brain. So if you can focus, that really helps. Um, if you can get motivated to prepare for lecture, that's really, really helpful. If you can just get ahead, read ahead in the book, if they've given you a book, review the last lecture before you go into the next lecture, that will really help your brain be focused while you're doing lectures. The hardest part is staying focused on the lecture, right? Um, and then this is when people told me they were amazed when they tried it, it started really helping, was doing your homework a little bit at a time. Because just like that video said, there's this temptation to wait until the deadline is looming, right? And to, and to be like, oh, it's okay, I have two more days before I have to do this. And I still do, as an adult, I still do this. I have a big workshop coming up and I had a workshop fall on its face about two weeks ago because I just kept putting it off. And all of a sudden the morning of the workshop, I got up and realized, I needed a lot more time for my brain to work on what I needed to do, and I did not have a good day. So really, starting to break it out, make that schedule, set your schedule, and set yourself up for success. Um, again, that mindset is monitoring your self-talk and staying positive. Again, putting even just putting little notes to yourself around, or even having that accountability partner or friend like just remind you that what you're good at <laughs> sometimes just really helps you. And then yes, rest, nutrition, exercise. I really hear that a lot of people are not taking care of themselves right now. And then that puts you at risk for getting the virus and at risk for getting um, sick. And then you're gonna have to start your semester over. So take care of yourselves, please. Um, if you want to try setting new habits, these are some really cool, um, little apps you can use that will help you, like if you're setting that schedule, put it in here and then the app will give you reminders, right? To stay on track and to do your goals. Um, so that's another recommendation that I have. Awesome. So anybody willing to put stuff in the chat, what'd you get from today? What's something new you're gonna try? If you tell me, I will hold you to it. <laughs> you could even email me and I will check in and see if you're doing it. But setting a goal right now might really help. What are you gonna try that's new and different? Anybody willing to put that in the chat before we go? We only have four minutes. Four minutes and you're done with the power hour. Or you can ask me questions. Becca, would you mind putting your email in case students want to call? Yeah, I will do yeah. that. Feel free to email me to get some tips and strategies or just to talk through something you're going through. Any questions, thoughts, comments, strategies for study for tests? Are y'all just exhausted? That's what I'm guessing. It's all, it's all good if we end three minutes early. I just wanna make sure you got what you came for. So if you have any questions you wanna stick around and ask me or things you want me to tell me about, the last thing I'll just leave you with is please advocate for yourself. Please 
feel free talking to your professors about how it's going and telling them if there's a certain thing that's not working for you or doesn't support your learning style. Please trust that there are a lot of professors out there that want to do this better and they want to hear from you. So reach out and tell them more about what you're experiencing.